Hey, good morning, friends. Pastor Justin here with Hartzell United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're joining with us again this morning as we gather together for worship and continue our Everyday Missionary Series. Let us begin this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we step into your presence today, and we are so glad that you've chosen to come and meet with us. We ask Jesus that that you would speak to us through these screens, wherever we are, wherever we may find ourselves this morning, that you would meet with us in a very powerful and special way. So whatever it is that might keep us from hearing from you, we ask, Lord Jesus, that it would fade away. But whatever sins we may have committed this week, Lord, we confess those to you. And we ask that you would once again shower us with your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, our reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Let us hear the words of the Lord. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by people. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people that they see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an old story. It goes back to the early 5th century AD. It's a story about a monk by the name of Telemachus. And because Telemachus was a monk, he spent most of his days isolated from the world, inside the confines of the church. He spent his time in prayer and meditation before God. But one day as he was praying, he really sensed that God was speaking to him and calling him to, to get up and to leave the confines of the monastery and go to the city of Rome. He didn't really know why God was telling him to do this. He just felt like God was calling him to do it. And so he packed his bags and he set out. And a couple weeks later, he finally arrived in the city of Rome. And when he got there, the city was just bubbling over with enthusiasm and excitement. The people were uh, just you know, in a frenzy, going from place to place. And, and most of them were heading into the Colosseum. You see, the Romans had just won a great military victory against the Goths. And so... The Roman Emperor had declared a series of games in order to celebrate that great victory. And so Telemachus thought, this must be the reason that I am here. And so he just went on into the Colosseum with all of the other people and the crowd. And, and, and he sat down, and before he knew it, violence began to unfold. The gladiators were fighting, and they were killing each other for sport and to the bloodlust and the cheers of the crowd. And this was deeply shocking to Telemachus. He was deeply, deeply sickened, and he couldn't believe what he was seeing. I mean, here he was, in the most civilized nation on the planet, in the most prestigious city in the world at that point in time, and the people were killing each other for sport. He, he just couldn't believe this, and he knew that something had to be done about it. And so he got up from his seat, he ran down the steps to the, to the edge of the Colosseum, he climbed over the walls, went out into the middle of the, of the arena, and he stood in between the gladiators, where he cried out at the top of his voice, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop. In the name of Jesus Christ, stop. And over and over again, he said those words. He was pleading with the gladiators, begging them to put down their weapons and to stop fighting. Now, some people in the crowd were a little amused by this. Other people were a little annoyed and, and they would begin to mock him and laugh at him. And eventually one man in the crowd picked up a rock that was seated next to his seat and he threw it at Telemachus. 
And pretty soon everyone in the entire Colosseum was picking up rocks and they were throwing at him, at, at Telemachus. And Telemachus ended up dying because he was being stoned. Now before long the, the crowd realized what they had done and this deep silence just began to penetrate the entire arena. Now just imagine what that would be like, the biggest football game of the year, just dead silence because of their guilt and their shame. And one by one the people started to get up out of their seats and they left the arena. The gladiators dropped their weapons and their swords to the ground. And in a couple days the emperor of Rome abolished all future games across the empire. Never again did people kill each other for sport? Telemachus was just one man. Just one man. He, he, he couldn't have imagined that he could change the course of human history, but that one man changed the world, all because he chose to be an everyday missionary right where he was, right there in the Colosseum in the most violent, bloody, gory, ungodly place on the face of the earth. He didn't plan to be there. He didn't even know why he was going to the city of Rome, but he chose to make a difference right where he was. He chose to be an everyday missionary. What about you? How might God be calling you to personally be an everyday missionary right where you live, work, and play? In the places that you find yourself every single day, whether that's the mall or the ball game or, or the grocery store or the barber shop. Whether you're at home, or you're at work, at the office, or at school. Over the last few weeks, I have been challenging you to step into your God-given purpose and call to be everyday missionaries wherever you are. And in the first week, we explored the call of Jesus Christ. And we saw that, that Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. He authorized us with the very power and authority of Jesus Christ. He sent us out into the world, even in the midst of our doubt. And he promised to be with us every single step of the way. Last week, we explored three reasons why God sends us out into the mission field. And we explored that verse, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And we saw that our witness is critically needed because all around us people are on a collision course with hell. That one in four people have no faith of any kind in our world. That mission we saw is critically urgent because Jesus is near. And Jesus sends us out because the potential is great because people are hungry for Jesus Christ. Today and over the next couple of weeks we're going to be turning to the how. How do we actually go about making a difference in the real places, the real relationships where we find ourselves every single day? And we're going to begin today by taking a look at another very famous passage of Scripture and where Jesus tells us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. At the core of both of those two images of salt and light is this idea of impact. Impact. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of salt to notice the difference that it makes on food. Just a little bit of salt goes a long way. It, it doesn't take a, a, a lot of difference to notice the impact that salt makes when you pour it onto an open wound, right? It stings immediately. And in the same way, light impacts everything that it touches. As soon as you turn a light on in a room, there's in, and in that instant, it moves from, from darkness to light. The darkness completely vanishes. The light takes over the room. Behind these two images is this idea of, of impact, that Jesus is calling us salt and light because we are called to make an impact on our world, right where we are. And so the question today is, how do we do that? Yeah, how, how do we actually go about making the kind of impact that Jesus is talking about here when he calls us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? And I want to suggest five things for you today. And the first is this, that to be salt and light means that we must get involved in the lives of other people. We have to get involved. 
several years ago, Rebecca Manley Pepper said this, to make a difference in the world means we have to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. We have to get out of the salt shaker and into the world. I mean, just think about it. Salt and light have no use in and of themselves, right? If you pour salt on a pile of salt, all you still have is a pile of salt. If you keep the salt in the salt shaker, it can't impact anything that salt's only use is to be poured out on something else. And in the same way, if you turn a light on in a room where no one is present, it doesn't do anything. Or if you turn a light on in a room that's already completely lit, it doesn't make any impact. It's, it's not the nature of the object to be hidden. Right? Jesus says no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bowl or a bushel basket. It, it, it's not the nature of light to be hidden. It's not the nature of salt to stay in the shaker. And so when we isolate ourselves from the world around us, and we hide out in our little shakers of our personal bubbles of home and, and church, and, and, and we don't get involved in the lives of anyone else, that we're, then we're failing to be the salt and light that Jesus is calling us to be. You see, we can't be the salt of the earth if we're not in the earth. We can't be the salt of the, wor- the light of the world if we're not actually out there in the world. We have to get involved in the lives of other people. And that's really what we're trying to start to do here at Hartzell Church. I mean, we're trying to do it with this book club that's beginning on the the fourth Thursday of January out at the Reading Library because we want to be there to to just be involved in the lives of people and to to spend time together and to get to know each other around a copy, common hobby. That's what we're trying to do through the block parties that we're going to be having over the next few months in the uh, in the early spring and summer uh, is that we're, we're, we're wanting to, to create spaces outside of the walls of the church where we can get involved in the lives of real people and begin to build relationships for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know that best happens when we gather together around common hobbies and interests with other people who enjoy those things as well. You know, I think of my own time at Diversion. Uh, Diversion is this virtual reality and board game shop that's just a couple miles from where uh, me and my wife Melissa live. and a few years ago, you know, we, we made this very conscious decision. I mean, we love playing board games. It's, it's our biggest hobby. We probably have hundreds of board games in our collection. And, and we, we could have just kept playing the games at home like we've been doing. But we made a conscious decision that we were going to go down to the game shop and begin to play games there and play games with the people who were there and to, to get to know the owners of the shop and the people who were working there and as we did that, relationships began to develop. Eventually, they found out that I was a pastor. And so, naturally, some faith-based conversations began to unfold. Doors began to open up. They asked questions. They, they even called us one Easter and said, We don't know any other churches. Can you come help us with uh, this Easter basket outreach that we want to do into our community? And, and you know, eventually, they started to see me. As their pastor, they started to come to church, and, and I was able to be there, you know, when, when loved ones passed away. I mean, it would have been a lot easier just to keep playing games at home. But because we put ourselves in a place where we could begin to formulate relationships, God began to do great things. And so here's my advice for you. Find something that you love to do and do it with other people. Not just your family, but the people that are around you who love to do that same hobby. Find something you love to do and do it with other people. If you go to the store, you know, whether or a restaurant, go there at the exact same time every single week because the same people work there week after week after week, generally at the same time. And, and, and when you're there, get to know them. Get to know their story. Listen to them. Pray for them. Build relationships with people right where you are every single day. You know, I wonder, how are you currently involved in the community around us? Who are you currently in relationship with? How are you currently investing in the lives of other people? Because to be salt and light, first and foremost, means we must get out of the salt shaker and into the world. 
Secondly, to be salt and light means we must consider the quality of our impact. The quality of our impact. Notice what the text doesn't say here. I mean, it doesn't say that we are called to be salt and to be light. It says you are salt and you are light. And in both cases, it's present, active language. In other words, he says that salt and light aren't something we're actually striving to be. It's who we already are. Right? We are salt and we are light in one way or another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it like this. He said, it's not for us to decide whether we will be salt or of the earth, for we are whether we like it or not. We have been made salt by the very call that we have received from Jesus Christ. Once again, it's not to you to be the light, it's you are the light. We already are the light because Jesus Christ has called us. How impossible, he says, how utterly absurd it would for us to try to become the light of the world. We already are the light. The call has made us so. In other words, the question is not whether we're actually going to be the salt and light. I mean, that's really already been determined. The question is, what's the quality of impact? What kind of salt are you going to be? What kind of light are you going to be in the world? What kind of difference are you actually going to make? Because you are making a difference one way or another, whether that's for good or for ill, in every conversation and interaction that you have in the world. I mean, just think about it. We've all had those meals that have been enhanced by just the right amount of salt. But we've probably also had those meals that were incredibly bland because they didn't have enough salt, or they were ruined because they had far too much salt. Right? The question is, what kind of salt are we being? Think of it like this. There, there are two major bodies of water in the nation of Israel. Uh, the first is the Sea of Galilee, and it's this incredibly beautiful lake that is filled with fish and surrounded by lush vegetation. The other is the Dead Sea. And, and the Dead Sea doesn't have much around it. You see, the salt content of the Dead Sea ranges from 26 to 35 percent of the lake. That means it is 10 times saltier than any ocean on the face of the planet. And so on the shore all you see is salt crystals. No plants of any kind. In the lake not a single living creature is there because the moment that anything swims into the lake it's instantly killed. And so here's the question. Are we more like the Sea of Galilee, or are we more like the Dead Sea? Do we give life to the people around us, or are we a toxic force that ends up killing everything that we touch? You see, with every interaction that we have, every conversation we have, we are either filling someone's bucket, or we are draining their bucket. We are either filling them up and building them up, or we are tearing them down. We either give life, or we kill. And so it forces us to consider what's really the quality of the impact that we're making right now, right in the places we are. What's the quality of our seasoning? Are we being salt and light in such a way that, that it enhances the message of the good news of Jesus Christ? Or does it take away from it? Do, do we impact the world by showing love and grace and forgiveness? Or do we hold grudges and bitterness and complain and harbor unforgiveness against other people? I mean, just ask yourself, is what you're about to say or what you're about to do or what you're about to post on Facebook going to enhance the message of Jesus Christ or is it going to turn people away? What's the quality of your impact? Thirdly, we see that to be salt and light means we have to stay in love with God. We have to stay in love with God. And that means, first and foremost, that we have to stay in contact with Him. I mean, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And that means if we are to be the light, we have to stay connected to the one who is the light. He tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, that if your eyes are good, your whole body is going to be good. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body is going to be filled with the darkness. In other words, you are what you eat. 
right? Well, whatever you plug into is going to drive the quality of the salt and the light that you can be in the world. And, and so we have to plug into Jesus. We have to stay connected to him. We have to plug into his word. We have to marinate in it, dwell in it. Because when we allow this thing to, to saturate our life, it begins to flavor every conversation and every uh, encounter that we have. We become like the things that we take in. But when we're disconnected from the one who is our source of light and the one who is our source of power, then other things are going to begin to saturate our life. You see, here's the point. Our values are driven by whatever we watch, by whatever we listen to, and by however we spend our time. Right? Whatever we plug into drives our life. Right? Think, think of a, an outlet. If you plug in, you're going to get electricity. If you plug it into anything else, you're not going to get the, the same result. Right? Whatever we plug into, whatever we watch, whatever we listen to, wherever we spend our time, those things are going to flavor our life. And so if we want to make a positive difference for Jesus Christ in this world, then we have to stay connected to the one who is our source of power, the one who is our source of light, the one who is our source of saltiness, and begin to disconnect from other things. You know, for me, that, that means I spend time every single morning reading the Bible, reflecting on my life, meditating, praying. I, I listen to worship music everywhere that I go in the car. I allow the presence of God to saturate my life so that I stay connected to Him. It also means at times that He's going to start to challenge me to disconnect from other things that are not of Him. Because I know there are things that sometimes I plug into that are not of God. You know, maybe there's TV shows I have to disconnect from because the values that they promote are not things that ultimately point others to Jesus. Maybe there's movies I need to disconnect from. Maybe there are values that, uh, whatever it is, because the place we're planted ultimately drives the season. You think of a tree. A tree that's planted by streams of living water is going to be fruitful. A tree that's planted in the desert doesn't quite produce the same kind of fruit. And so it raises the question as we think about this new year that we're in. What are some practices that we need to start to, to plug into Jesus in 2022? And what maybe are the things that we need to disconnect from so that we have the time and the space to connect more to him? And so those other things stop filling our lives. Uh, fourthly, we see that to be salt and light means we need to live out our faith in this world. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel every day. If necessary, use words. Jesus says this right here in verse 16. Let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Right? This entire narrative in many ways is placed right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is this discourse that's all about how we live in the world. You know, throughout Matthew 5-7, to Jesus gives us his most extensive discourse for how we go about living the life that God desires for us. And he calls us to, to abandon hate, to extend forgiveness, to be reconciled with people, to watch our eyes, to examine the lustfulness of our heart. He calls us to marital faithfulness. To for, he forbids divorce. He calls us never to take revenge, to love our neighbors, to pray for our enemies, to be generous with the poor, to pray and to fast to trust God, to refuse to worry. I mean, this entire text is really one that's about one word, distinctiveness. Distinctiveness. It calls us to be different from the world because this isn't the kind of things that the world does. You see, the power of salt lies in its distinctiveness. It's that it's different from pepper or garlic or onion powder. It, it, it gives a certain taste because it is distinct from everything else. Light is distinct from the darkness. Our distinctiveness matters if we're going to make an impact. We can't be chameleons that are blending in with our world and living like everyone else in the world. I think back to high school. I worked at Arby's at the time and there was this guy there by the name of Dusty. And Dusty was a pretty rough guy. He'd had a really difficult and hard life. Uh, he'd really been gone through the ringer. And his life pretty much reflected it. Right? It was clear in his language. 
It was clear in the way he lived. And, and I didn't say a whole lot at first, um, but as we worked together, over time we quickly became friends. And, and he knew that I attended church. He knew my faith was important to me. And, and, and over time, whenever we were around each other, he started to change the way he, he'd acted, right? He talked different. He lacked it different. He would say different things. He'd apologize if he cussed. Uh, you know, he would ask questions about faith. He even came to church one time when it was the first time I preached. And my life was different enough, it was distinctive enough, that it was attractive to him in some way. But I think the number one problem that we have in the church today is that we've lost our distinctiveness. You know, I think back to the Old Testament. God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and they give them all these rules and regulations and all this stuff, but it's ultimately about being different from the world, being set apart from the world so that they see us and they say, what in the world is different here? But yet the thing that the people of God wanted over and over and over again is to be just like everybody else. They wanted a king just like everyone else. They wanted to do this just like everyone else. They lost their distinctiveness. I'm reminded of the church that we see in the book of Revelation in the city of Thyatira. Thyatira was this city that was known for their numerous trade guilds throughout the city. And pretty much every single business of any kind had a trade guild with it. Uh, so if you were a shoemaker, you were in the shoemaker guild. If you were a, a die maker, you were in the die maker guild. If you were a brass maker, you were in the brass maker guild. There were pottery guilds and farmer guilds and factory guilds and doctor guilds. And there, every trade that you can think of had its own guild. And, and if you were to make money in that trade, in that city, you had to be a part of the guild. The problem was... The, the, the each and every guild had its own patron deities, gods and goddesses, and, and to truly participate in the life of the guild meant that you had to go to the feasts and the festivals and participate in the sacrifices and all these stuff and, and that, that went along with the worship of these other gods. And so they did what they had to. Right? They compromised. They became like chameleons, and what happened at church on Sunday stayed at church on Sunday, and what happened at the guild stayed at the guild. And God called them out because they lost their distinctiveness. They lost their saltiness because they had become just like everything else. Notice what he says. If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Right? It's our distinction that makes us salty. It's the difference that we have to the world. We can't be chameleons. I mean, it really comes down to this. If our actions look no different than anyone else in this world, then why would they want what we have? It's our distinctiveness. Our distinctiveness that points people to Jesus. And so the question I want to ask, does your life really reflect a different set of values than we see throughout the world? Are you distinct and different? And if not, where do you need to begin to do things differently and act differently when the same circumstances hit everybody else? How might we need to respond differently from the world in the midst of this pandemic that we're facing? And then finally, to be salt and light means that we have to speak with others about our faith. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says this, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. You see, the fact is, words without actions are pointless. It's ineffective, it's useless. But at the same time, actions without words are very easily misunderstood. And I think a lot of times we want our actions to do all the talking, but if that other person has never heard of Jesus Christ, how are they going to draw the right conclusion of why it is that we're different, of why it is that we do what we do? You see, without words, they can't draw the proper conclusions. They can't quite connect the dots right. They need someone to step in and explain, this is why I'm distinct. This is why I'm different. This is why I don't live like the world lives. 
Our actions will be misunderstood if they are not complemented with words. Romans puts it this way, How are they to call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in the one in whom they've never heard of? And how are they to hear without somebody proclaiming, speaking to them? You see, we can only really make an impact of salt and light in the world if we have actions that represent God, and those actions are complemented with words that, that proclaim why it is we are the way we are. And so I wonder, who is it that you are currently speaking to about your faith in Jesus Christ? Who is it that you're inviting to church? You know, maybe it's difficult for you to figure out the words to say. Invite them to come with you. Uh, you see, we, we're salt and light. We're salt and light when we speak to others, when we live it out, when, when, when we consider the quality of our impact, when we're involved in the lives of other people, and when we stay in love with God. So let us pray today. Heavenly Father, we come to you because our desire is to make an impact. Our desire is to make a difference right where we live, work, and play. And so we pray for right now, Lord, you show us what our next step is, that one thing that we need to take from this. Maybe for some of us, we're not involved in the lives of anybody. Or maybe for others, we're that toxic force and we need to start changing things a little bit so that we, we give off a positive flavor. You know, maybe there, there are others of us here who are plugging into the wrong things or, or we're just not staying connected with Jesus like we need to. But maybe there are some of us who it's how we live, that there's something in our life that is not distinct from the world and we need to get right with you. Maybe we just need to start speaking. Whatever it is for us, we ask that you would give us the strength this week to take that step of faith. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Uh, just one announcement that I wanted to... Uh, provide for you today. We announced this at church this past week, but we wanted to announce it on Facebook as well, so the rest of you would know this as well. The, the leadership board has decided to cancel the 2022 fish fry, uh, and we did that because Larchview Drive is currently a mess. It's under construction, and it's supposed to last through the end of the year, and that means getting hundreds and hundreds of cars to our property every single week for that event just isn't realistic. It's going to be very difficult. And Gordon Food Service also informed us that we probably won't have the good fish that we normally had simply because of global supply chain issues. And so for those reasons, we've decided to forego this year's fish fry, and we would ask that you put your in the energy that you would put into those things, into supporting our Easter egg cunt in April, as well as the block parties that we're going to be having in April and May and June. Uh, and we know that means we're probably going to have a little less income, uh, but we believe with your faith and your ongoing support uh, that we will prevail. So make sure you're sending in your gifts to the church. We're hoping to have online giving up pretty soon as well, uh, where you'll be able to give that way. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, feel free to reach out to us you know, at the church. We'd be glad to, to answer any of those. And we look forward to being able to resume it again next year in 2023. So may God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you that you may be salt and light in this world. Amen.